Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our uh, Wednesday uh, lecture today. Pakistan is a country that deserves a lot more attention than we, than we tend to pay it in this country. It is a large nation, it is nuclear armed, it has serious problems of terrorism, it is right next to Afghanistan where Australian soldiers are fighting and it has a very high birth rate and a very low rate of economic growth. This is a country that will play a prominent role in, for good and bad, for good or bad, in uh, the international relations of the 21st century. So it's a great pleasure to, uh, to bring, oh, to introduce uh, Professor Anatol Levin who has just published a book on Pakistan to talk to us today about Pakistan, a hard country. Anatol Levin is professor in the War Studies Department of King's College, London, and a senior fellow of the New America Foundation in Washington, DC. His books include Chechnya, Tombstone of Russian Power, and America Right or Wrong, An Anatomy of American Nationalism and Ethical uh, and Ethical Realism with John Holzman. He lived in Pakistan as a journalist for the Times of London in the 1980s and has sp spent long periods there in recent years, most recently in March of this year. Uh, he has been in all of Pakistan's provinces and major cities. And I, I will also mention that uh, Professor Levin is in Sydney as the guest of the US Studies Centre, so we thank them for... Uh, for allowing him to come and speak to us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Anatole Lieber. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to the Lowy and thanks also to the US Studies Center for, for bringing me to Australia. I'm most grateful. Um, yes, this is a rather odd talk because it's a talk about a book which unfortunately hasn't appeared here yet, um, though it will in, um, in August and it's available from Amazon. Uh, as I always say, um, the importance of Pakistan, uh, in fact, recognizing that um, in a great many ways, Pakistan is in fact the most important and also the most dangerous country in the Muslim world, uh, is a matter not of sentiment, but of mathematics. Um, with almost 200 million people now, uh, Pakistan has two thirds the population uh, of the entire Arab world. Um, it has six times the population of Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, it has an army of more than 500,000 men. Uh, and those are good men, by the way, uh, in their own terms, well-trained, highly motivated. Um, and of course, uh, it has nuclear weapons, as we're always reminded. I mean, the importance of Pakistan is, of course, something that you can hardly avoid recognizing if you're a Brit, uh, because, of course, we have a huge Pakistani diaspora in Britain which is intimately connected, not just back to Pakistan, not just back to its provinces of origin in Pakistan, but back to its districts, towns, and villages of origins in Pakistan through continual familial intermarriage. Um, now, the thing is that that is, well, unfortunately, as we saw um, on 7-7 in, in London, potentially a, a great problem for Britain in terms of terrorism. Uh, however, of course, it's not a problem for Britain alone, um, insofar as uh, Pakistani population in Britain, also citizens of Britain and of the European Union. Um, and as I found when visiting Ottawa, talking to the Canadian government there in, um, in April, uh, the very large Pakistani diaspora in Canada um, means that this is the affairs of Pakistan are, are also a major concern uh, for, pa uh, for Canada. And therefore, by definition, for the United States as well. Although I fear in recent years, I mean, very understandably, um, but nonetheless, in some ways, rather worryingly, the needs of the war in Afghanistan um, have led the United States, in some ways, uh, in my view, uh, into a set of um, strategic or possibly tactical miscalculations when it comes to Pakistan. Uh, because in the end, uh, we can withdraw from Afghanistan. I mean, it will be a messy process, um, will in some ways be a depressing one, in many ways a depressing one, 
in certain respects, perhaps a humiliating one even. But I think we can withdraw from Afghanistan without doing ourselves tremendous strategic damage, even if, God forbid, Afghanistan does collapse after we leave. If Pakistan collapses, then we are facing a catastrophe, frankly, um, above all, because uh, before even you get to the apocalyptic threat of the loss of control over nuclear weapons, uh, even if the Pakistani army seriously frays or collapses, uh, you are talking about the loss of control of both weapons and expertise, uh, which would increase the terrorist threat to the West by orders of magnitude, anti-aircraft missiles, ammunition, trained engineers, and so forth and so on. So we need to balance our... We, in fact, we, we are trying to balance uh, our policy towards Pakistan between the short-term needs of the war in Afghanistan and the long-term needs uh, of the struggle against terrorism in general. Uh, it's obvious that, unfortunately, safe havens in Pakistan are of critical importance to the Afghan Taliban. Uh, on the, and this has made tremendous problems, of course, for our forces in, in Afghanistan. Australian forces, British forces, American forces, and others. On the other hand, uh, in general, not by any means perfectly, uh, but in general, uh, Pakistan and the Pakistani intelligence services have been fairly helpful when it comes to international terrorism directed against our homelands. Um, as you know, a number of uh, Al Qaeda, leading Al Qaeda figures, have been arrested in Pakistan with the help of the um, uh, of the ISI, the chief Pakistani military intelligence service. Um, this includes Khalid uh, Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin Al Shib, and um, as you may well have noticed here in Australia, uh, in Abbottabad itself, where Bin Laden was killed uh, in January, the Pakistanis uh, arrested an Indonesian terrorist leader. Umar Patek, linked to Al-Qaeda and allegedly one of those responsible for planning the Bali bombings uh, and handed him over to the Indonesian authorities. So while on the one hand, not just with regard to the Afghan Taliban, but obviously there must be deep suspicions about the Pakistani official role in sheltering bin Laden, there is another side to the picture when it comes to help against international terrorism. I'll try to explain these features in, in a second. Um, problematic as Pakistan is in many ways, uh, therefore, we need to remember that from two points of view, it is nonetheless crucial. One is in controlling international terrorism on its soil. And we do need to remember from that point of view that in the end, it is only a Pakistani state and state forces that can do that. Um, as I often say, uh, if, God forbid, an enormous purple rabbit were to take power in Pakistan, as long as that rabbit were minimally responsive to our vital interests and vital needs, we would have no choice but to deal with it. Because the alternative option of going into Pakistan ourselves and trying to run things, or of using India in the end to do so, is not in fact an option. In the end, we are going to be reliant on the Pakistani authorities to control their own society. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, that the best chance, I would say possibly after um, an American invasion of Saudi Arabia, the best chance that the terrorists have of dealing a really catastrophic, well, catastrophic blow to US power is to provoke the United States into bringing about the collapse of Pakistan. Um, and the obvious way to do that would be through a terrorist attack as on the United States, God forbid. Um, based in Pakistan that would provoke America into taking some sort of action that would collapse Pakistan as a state. Uh, the, the, the reason, and I mean, sh short, I'm not talking here about a full-scale invasion of Pakistan, um, but 
there is a, a, a very worrying scenario far short of that, um, which was, I think, very much brought to the fore by the, the raid to kill bin Laden. By the way, I entirely approved of the raid, to, both the raid and the fact that they killed him. Uh, don't get me wrong. But if this were to become a pattern of American behavior, uh, or if it were to be launched on a much larger and more sustained scale, then there is a very great risk that at some stage American forces would actually come into conflict with Pakistani forces. And then one of two things would happen. Either the Pakistani generals would order their men to fight, then you would actually have a battle between Pakistani army and the American army, with consequences uh, that would be, as you might say, unpredictable, um, but almost certainly extremely bad for American-Pakistani relations, uh, never mind which side won. The other possibility is, if anything, even more sin sinister, which is that the Pakistani generals would tell their men not to fight, and their men would mutiny in order to fight the Americans. Uh, and to understand why, um, possibly the most frightening thing I've heard during my travels to Pakistan uh, was that when Pakistani soldiers were going home on leave to their villages, their towns, uh, not just their neighbours, uh, but even their own women folk were beginning to ask them, why are you acting as slaves of the Americans? Why are you taking American money to kill fellow Muslims, fellow Pakistanis? It's difficult to exaggerate how humiliating this is for a Pakistani soldier. Now, drone attacks, of course, well, the Pakistani high command is actually implicated in the drone attacks on, on their own soil because, of course, those drone attacks have killed many Pakistani militants as well. So there's a great deal of hypocrisy here. The rank and file don't like the drone attacks at all, but they can't do anything about them. They can't actually shoot the drones down. I mean, for that, you need anti-aircraft fire aeroplanes or whatever. If American soldiers come in on the ground, they can do something. They can fight. And I'm told by um, you know, everybody from privates up to a lieutenant general uh, that in those circumstances, the pressure on them to fight, the moral, the emotional pressure, would be very great. And if the Pakistani army splits, which it has never done in the past, um, every Pakistani coup has been by the then serving chief of staff with the consensus of the, the senior officers. If there is actually a mutiny, within the Pakistani army, then that is the one thing which can, in the short to medium term, destroy the Pakistani state very quickly indeed. Which is another way of saying that the militants in Pakistan are not nearly strong enough on their own to overthrow the Pakistani state. Um, I was, uh, for, for two basic reasons, uh, the first is that as long as it remains united, uh, the army is strong enough not to prevent terrorism, not even to prevent low-level infiltration of, it, of itself, as we saw from the attack on the naval base uh, in Karachi a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but um, as I found uh, during my stays in the northwest front, frontier province, now Haiba Pakhtunkhwa, over the years, and as was confirmed to me when I went back to Swat this March, um, the army is strong enough to defeat in particular areas, roll back to some extent, contain insurgency. Swat was actually controlled by the Pakistani Taliban and their allies up to the spring of 2009. Then there was a, a very successful and determined... Sorry, can you hear me? I think I forgot to turn this thing on. Um, a, a very successful, determined, and indeed ruthless military campaign. Um, there was a lot of extrajudicial execution associated with it, uh, but as a result, um, the Taliban has in fact been driven out of SWAT um, and hasn't been a, a serious terrorist attack there now for more than six months. Something, by the way, to keep in mind that just you know to preserve a certain balance. Um, which is that, uh, as I've said, um, and as is perfectly obvious, um, the Afghan, the leadership of the Afghan Taliban has been given shelter. I mean, the, man, uh, the ordinary soldiers of the Afghan Taliban have been given shelter by much of the population, uh, the Pashtun population of the Pakistani tribal areas. 
the leadership has been given shelter by the, uh, the Pakistani army. I'm not saying it's the same thing in reverse, but I'm sure you can all imagine where the leadership of the Swat Taliban have gone. Afghanistan. They've gone back to, to their old haunts in Afghanistan, where they fought the Soviets uh, in the 1980s. The latest really big attack of Pakistani insurgents on the Pakistani military, which killed in all, I think, getting on for 100 people um, a few days ago, uh, including at least 25 soldiers. Um, where was that launched from? Afghanistan. So we do need to remember that our militants, if you will, our Afghan militants come over to them, but it's also true that militants in Afghanistan attack them from Afghanistan, and we have not been able to prevent that. So, I mean, in other words, this is a hellishly difficult area to control. That's something of an aside. But anyway, my point is, chief point, the army can contain the insurgents. It can drive them back from particular areas. And as long as the army remains united, there cannot be a successful insurgency uh, against the state. The other reason why this is not possible uh, is, and I won't go into this too much because this is not really what my talk today is about, but my book is very largely about this, uh, that the quasi-democracy, a heavy emphasis on the quasi-democracy um, that exists in Pakistan, and the deeply entrenched and intertwined elite groups that dominate that democracy, deeply rooted in the leadership of local kinship networks and in the distribution of state patronage, which is a nice way of saying corruption, uh, are an immensely powerful force against revolution. So the Islamists, under their own strength, um, are not strong enough to overthrow the Pakistani state. They are, of course, quite strong enough, as we've seen, to carry out dreadful terrorist attacks across Pakistan. But that's a rather different matter. To the best of my knowledge, no state has ever been overthrown simply by terrorism. You need some combination of insurgency, a mass movement on the streets, and a mutiny of the army. You see different mixtures of this in different places. Um, Vietnam and, and China, insurgency. Uh, Iran uh, in 1979 and Russia in 1917, combination of a mass movement on the streets and ultimately a mutiny of the army, and so forth and so on. But you need one of these things. Terrorism alone won't hack it. By far, and... <clears throat> The other third reason why the militants are not strong enough uh, to overthrow the Pakistani state on their own is that their religious ideology is shared only by a minority of the Pakistani people. Um, Pakistan is very religiously divided, on top, of course, of being very ethnically divided, and divided according to provinces, divided according to tribes in many, many areas. Um, now, this is... Uh, hellish problem when it comes to the development of Pakistan, but it does make it much more difficult, in fact I would say totally impossible actually, to get a, any kind of united revolutionary movement going. Um, a Pakistani business friend in Lahore once said to me that we Pakistanis couldn't agree on an Islamist revolution because we can't agree on anything. <laughs> uh, but. So they can't rely on their own strength, and they can't rely on the strength of their ideology. What they can rely on, unfortunately, especially if America were, in a sense, to play into their hands, is anti-Americanism. Uh, unfortunately, as every opinion poll shows, and as I, I can attest to you from my own interviews with every level of Pakistani society over the years, the levels of anti-Americanism in Pakistan are extraordinarily high. Um, and this, I think, d does bring out something that um, Al-Qaeda's number two, Ayman al-Zawahiri, well, now number one, sorry, um, uh, wrote in a famous passage to Zarqavi, the leader of Al-Qaeda in, um, in Iraq. I'm paraphrasing, but basically he said, the great majority of Arabs and Muslims 
do not agree with our ideology or our theology. What they all agree with, more or less, is when we can present ourselves as defending the Muslim world against the Americans and the Israelis, against outside infidel conquest. This brings out the fact that while um, the great majority of Muslims uh, do not believe in offensive jihad, as they would call it, um, there is a very strong belief in defensive jihad. And this is something on which Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan have been able to play with tremendous success. The great majority of Pakistanis do not support or sympathize with the Pakistani Taliban as a revolutionary force against Pakistan. The overwhelming majority sympathize with the Afghan Taliban, but in the same way that they sympathize with the Afghan Mujahideen um, when I was there in the 1980s. They see them, unfortunately, and I, I take no pleasure in, in this statement, but unfortunately they do see them as a legitimate resistance force in Afghanistan against a foreign occupation of their country. Now, they might see things very differently if they were Afghans, of course, but the point is that these people are fighting in Afghanistan, not in Pakistan. Uh, or, as I say, in their own terms, people who are waging a defensive jihad against outside attack. The best chance the militants in Pakistan have is if they can portray themselves as waging a defensive jihad within Pakistan against the United States. So this is something that if we conceivably can, or the Americans can, because it's not up to us, unfortunately, um, we do need to avoid at all costs. Now, when it comes to the, um, the attitudes of the Pakistani state, by which I basically mean the Pakistani military, um, a, a, an American journalist asked me after bin Laden was killed, but how can President Zardari not have known that bin Laden was, was being sheltered on his territory? And I replied that, you know, assuming that it was Pakistani intelligence, well, they might have got round to telling their president about this after they told almost everybody else in the country. <laughs> um, it's really not the fault of the government. I mean, the point is that in this area, uh, a Pakistani policy is made by the military high command. Uh, it's an open question whether sections of the ISI have their own co you know, secret policies, uh, secret even from their own commanders. Very difficult to say. All one can say is that they, if they did, they could. Uh, because since they creamed off so much American aid to the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s, not just the ISI as a whole, but even sections within it have had their own private secret sources of funding, which do allow them to carry out separate operations if they wish to do so. Anyway, when it comes to the uh, strategy of the Pakistani military high command as a whole uh, towards um, the militant and terrorist groups, uh, as I remarked at the US uh, Studies Center um, the day before yesterday, people say that Pakistan has a two-faced attitude uh, towards this, but that's totally unfair. It doesn't have a two-faced attitude. It has a four-faced attitude. Um, and the four faces are, it, has one, it turns one face towards the Pakistani Taliban and their allies, one face towards the Afghan Taliban and their allies are totally different faces. Although, of course, it, not totally different, because it's all, they're all, tangled, all of these are tangled up together, but nonetheless, one can distinguish four different strategies. Uh, a third face towards international, towards terrorists in Pakistan who are trying to target the West directly, not in Afghanistan, but actually plotting terrorist attacks against London or New York, Sydney. And a fourth face towards terrorists who are planning terrorist attacks on India. So four distinguishable separate policies. Now, what are they? Um, first, the Pakistani Taliban, after a long period of hesitation, not just on the part of the military, by the way, but it's very important to stress on the part of the main political parties as well when it came to combating militancy within Pakistan. Up to the spring of 2009, very hesitant about that, and there were many attempts to make peace deals with, <coughs> with the Taliban, um, largely because the... Um, sorry, forgive me. Um, largely because the, the mass of the Pakistani popula uh, population 
were so deeply hostile to the idea of launching major campaigns against these people. Um, but after the spring of 2009, when the Pakistani Taliban emerged as a clear threat to the Pakistani state, since then, uh, as, as I've seen for myself, there has been a very determined and, as I say, ruthless fight back. Um, I don't know if any of you have read the Human Rights Watch report on the military campaign in Swat, uh, talk, uh, talking about the, the number of extrajudicial executions by the military there. Well, from my own interviews in Swat, I could, both in 2009 and back in March of this year, I can uh, tell you that that report is entirely accurate. Um, so, uh, when it comes to preserving the Pakistani state from Islamist revolution, the Pakistani military is now fighting hard. Up to the point, of course, where the territories where the Pakistani Taliban are operating begin to merge with the territories where the Afghan Taliban are based. Now, what is the explanation of the, the attitude towards the Afghan Taliban? Well, it's twofold. The first, as I say, is the attitude the attitude of the mass of the population, which sees the Afghan Taliban as basically legitimate, I'm sorry to say. Um, now, of course, this is particularly strong in the tribal areas of Pakistan, because there you have direct, not just ethnic Pashtun uh, affinity, but actually common tribal loyalties. Uh, elsewhere, it's much weaker, but it, it extends, you know, at least in a, in a very soft sense, as I say, to the overwhelming mass of the the Pakistani population. This, by the way, reflects something else, um, which, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is actually a dent, in a, a small dent in a wall in Karachi where I was reduced uh, on one occasion actually literally to banging my head against it in fury at the latest Pakistani conspiracy theory. But of course, the biggest conspiracy theory, and you understand, and, and a theory which is a completely poisonous rubbish, but is believed, once again, by the overwhelming majority of Pakistanis I've talked to, sadly educated as well as uneducated, is that 9-11, you know the plot, that it, it, it wasn't Al-Qaeda at all, it was an Israeli-American conspiracy in order to give America the excuse to invade and conquer parts of the Muslim world. I'm sorry to say that while that uh, belief was not too strong before uh, the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Iraq basically spread it throughout Pakistani society. Uh, so inevitably, therefore, people who believe this uh, grant no legitimacy whatsoever to our presence in, in Afghanistan. They simply see it as an aspect of imperial conquest. So that's the population in general, why they shelter the Afghan Taliban. The calculations of the military high command are rather different, and they are about the future of Afghanistan after we leave, which they are now convinced, and with good reason, of course, that we are doing. And, and they believe, and once again, I'm sorry to say, with considerable support, to which I'll come back at the end, uh, that we are going to leave with the job unfinished. Um, and that what we will leave behind is an Afghan civil war. Uh, that one of the, the obvious principal forces in that civil war uh, will be groups bitterly hostile to Pakistan, above all among the Panjshiri Tajiks who dominate the Afghan army, and that those groups will be backed by India uh, in an effort to encircle and weaken Pakistan. Now, there is an enormous amount of anti-Indian paranoia in this, but there are enough also elements of truth to give it you know, a certain degree of credence. The military high command, therefore, uh, believes that it has to have some sort of allies in Afghanistan for the civil war of the future, uh, and that the only available allies, and many of the generals say, unfortunately, um, there is great sympathy for the Afghan Taliban in sections of the military, but I have to say that even completely secular Pakistani generals uh, with daughters doing PhDs in the United States have said to me in private that for purely strategic reasons we have no choice but to maintain the Afghan Taliban as allies in, um, in Afghanistan. So this is the, the strategic calculation. Uh, I'll come back at the end to some of the nuances of that and how we could perhaps turn this to our advantage.
so those are the first two faces towards the, um, the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban. Uh, then there is the face turned towards terrorists targeting our homelands directly. Here, as I say, you know, obviously the Bin Laden case creates a major question mark, uh, but there have been other cases where they have been genuinely helpful, and as the British Secret Service will tell you, uh, on a, a number of occasions, their help has been crucial in identifying British Pakistanis who've travelled back to Pakistan for training, indoctrination, and have come back to Britain to plan terrorist plots. Uh, why have they been so helpful there? Well, two reasons, or well, three. First, they have no strategic interest whatsoever in promoting terrorism against the West. Once again, I mean, sinister possibility that there are actual ideological sympathizers within Pakistani military intelligence and the low levels of the army. But the generals have no interest in this at all. They have a very strong interest, on the other hand, in preventing it because they know very well, because they've been told very clearly, that if there is a successful terrorist attack on the United States, based in Pakistan, especially from a group which has had any kind of connections to the Pakistani army, then God help them, because the American response will be crushing. Um, so those calculations, but there is an additional fact. Um, uh, what, what would be a, a fairly obvious, and uh, don't tell anybody I said this for God's sake, um, but a, a, a fairly obvious terrorist target in London, Harrods international elite, Western corruption, all these things. Any bomb in Harrods on any given day of the year would take out a chunk of the Pakistani political elite. <laughs> um, uh, they, um, a great many of them live five or ten minutes' walk from Harrods. So they also have the, the elite, including the military elite, has no interest in promoting international terrorism. So there they have been, as I say, by no means perfectly, but imperfectly, shall we say, helpful in preventing international terrorism. Well, international terrorism, with one exception, well, or in Afghanistan is one exception. Um, the other big exception is, of course, India, where in the past, uh, and all, well, almost certainly up to 2008 and Mumbai as well, uh, the Pakistani military as an institution through the ISI was, of course, I mean, absolutely uh, part of the, not, not the original creation, but certainly the fostering, the arming, the training of militant groups targeting India. Uh, these groups, by the way, they didn't begin by targeting India. They began by targeting the, the Soviets and communists in Afghanistan in the 1980s. That was when they were first built up. But after the Soviets left Afghanistan, the military switched uh, switched them to attack India after the beginnings of the Kashmiri revolt against India in 1988. Uh, so the military and the ISI has been very close to these groups indeed. Now since, well, starting with 2002 with Musharraf, and then even more strongly after the tremendous international pressure on them after Mumbai in 2008, uh, they have reined in those groups. Um, they have not cracked down on them, but they have reined them in uh, from attacking India and also from attacking us. Once again, I mean, they, they have prevented these, these groups uh, from engaging in terrorism against us. But the problem is, of course, that this has also involved keeping close relations with them. And I was told by, shall we say, informed sources in Pakistan, that the deal with Lashkar-e Taiba, the group that carried out um, the Mumbai terrorist attacks, and uh, Jamaat ud its sort of social welfare public face, if you will, um, has been as follows. Uh, and by the way, I mean, Lashkar-e Taiba is widely regarded by um, Western intelligence as one of the most formidable um, terrorist groups in the world, given what happened in Mumbai and some other attacks against India. So the deal is, is as follows. One, uh, you must not obviously join the Pakistani Taliban in revolt against Pakistan. I mean, well, I better say, I mean, the first point is we will not attack you. We will not crack down on you if you follow the, the following rules. One, no attack on Pakistan. Secondly, 
no attack on the West, period. You must not get involved in terrorist attacks against the West because, once again, this will bring the wrath of God down on our heads. An interest, I had an interesting talk there with uh, Jamaat Dawa, spokesman. Um, uh, I, 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 I didn't ask, well, I, mean, I did ask him about terrorism against the West, but of course he denied they'd even ever thought about it. Um, but I did ask him why they didn't, given that they are you know, Islamist revolutionaries by ideology, why they don't join the revolt against Pakistan. And what he said was rather interesting, and I think it can be sort of extended to international terrorism as well, given what could happen to Pakistan as a result. He said, I'm sort of paraphrasing slightly, but he said, look, of course we don't like the existing Pakistani state. And yes, you're quite right, we would like to replace it with a true Islamic um, republic. But we regard even this imperfect Pakistani state that we have as the essential defender of the Muslims of South Asia against the Hindus by which he meant India, of course. He said, much as we may dislike the Pakistan of today, we are not going to do anything which will ruin this state and allow the Hindus to march in over the ruins to dominate us. Therefore, it struck me that it was perhaps also credible that the military may be able to persuade them not to attack the West directly, thereby bringing America in to destroy Pakistan. Uh, however, there's a fourth element, and this brings me back to the very beginning, which is, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, open season when it comes to lashkar e Taiba activists going there to fight. As an ex-ISI officer said to me, look, these boys joined lashkar e Taiba to fight, not to sit around in Lahore doing social work. Um, if we don't allow them to go off to fight somewhere, they'll fight against us. Yeah. Uh, Andy said, do you, do you actually want that? Um, you know, you're going to get out of Afghanistan. Um, here in Pakistan, you know, we have to control this threat. It's a threat against you. It's a threat against us. Make of it what you will. But anyway, that's the, the official argument. Uh, one other nuance about that, which I think people haven't fully realized in the West. Um, when we talk about a crackdown on these groups, we think about arresting them, putting them on trial, and so forth. The title of my book, um, Pakistan, a Hard Country, it's meant to suggest, you know, hard dilemmas for us and so forth. But the actual phrase, been used to me, either a hard country or a difficult country, um, many times over the years, usually um, in the context of somebody explaining why he's had to have somebody else shot. The last time I heard it was from a senior superintendent of police in southern Punjab uh, back in 2009. Uh, who said to me, look, um, uh, our, quite candidly, you know, um, uh, this police force is extremely uh, inefficient and corrupt and also scared. The courts are scared and with good reason intimidated and also often sympathetic. Uh, therefore, it is hopeless um, to think of arresting uh, he was talking about the sectarian terrorists who I haven't mentioned, but who've now joined the Pakistani Taliban, the, the anti-Shia terrorists, Lashkar Janvi. It's hopeless uh, to think of arresting these people and putting them on trial. Uh, we never get a conviction. And he said, yeah, and it's also because we're, we're useless at putting together a kind of evidence that would actually stand up for interrogation. So he said, most of the time we leave them alone. But, you know, if they get get above themselves, you know, if, if they actually seem to be emer emerging as a real threat to the state, if they do something particularly nasty, if they, you know, carry out a really big attack, kill a politician, or kill us, <laughs> what do we do? We send them a message to back off. How do we send them that message? We take three of the nastiest ones out to, into a field in the middle of the night and we shoot them in the back of the head. It's called in both India and Pakistan encounter killings, and we pretend that there was a, an encounter, an armed encounter. You have to understand, he said, I know that doesn't sound very nice, but you have to understand this is a hard country. Now, the point is, if the Pakistani military starts taking, given the prestige of the anti-Kashmiri, uh, sorry, the anti-Indian jihadis, the Kashmiri jihadis, in Pakistani society. Pakistani army starts taking them out in the middle of the night and shooting them. We have a problem, not just in Punjab, but in Bradford, 
because the Pakistani population of Bradford, which will very soon be a majority of that city, comes from Pakistani Kashmir, from Mirpur. So the whole business of calling for a crackdown on, on these people is more complicated uh, than it looks. Where should we go very briefly from here? Um, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, well, I am, I have to say, given you know, my travels in Afghanistan both in the 1980s and after 2000, in the years after 2001, pretty skeptical uh, about our chances of building up uh, the Afghan state uh, into a force that will actually be able to dominate at least the Pashtun areas after we leave. Uh, we're having more success in building up the Afghan National Army, but then again, the Afghan National Army is very ethnically divided. Uh, if what we leave behind is a state which will very quickly suffer a military coup, well, the problem is it could be a military coup followed by a counter-coup, followed by a counter-coup against the counter-coup by different ethnic forces within the army. And before we know it, uh, we'll be in the position of the Soviets in 1979 choice of either pulling out completely or going back in to restore order. It does seem to me, therefore, um, that what the Obama administration is now tentatively beginning to try to do does make sense, which is see if you can negotiate a settlement with the Afghan, the leadership of the Afghan Taliban. If that, I mean, if in response to questions, I can talk about what that might look like. But the point is that if that does become the strategy, then Pakistan potentially at least moves uh, from, and potentially and to some extent, uh, from being what it is now in Afghanistan, which is a colossal problem, uh, to being perhaps an essential asset. Uh, because it may well be that only Pakistan can actually bring the influence to bear on the Taliban uh, to get them to agree to a depressing, but at least a minimally adequate Afghan peace settlement. Thank you.